Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love him and serve him as his own dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you the strength to live according now to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. Your word, O oh stands firm in the heavens. Faithfulness continues forever. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in Him. We pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are unworthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Invite the children of the congregation to come forward at this time. Oh, I can face around this way by you here. Good morning. How are you all today? Good? I got a sign here for you. You ever seen this before? I saw a sign like this. You ever seen someone holding this outside? What does that say? Will work for food. Is that what, that's what it says. This is sometimes a sign that I see people holding. It looks just like this. You can feel it if you want. Just a cardboard sign. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm driving around the Twin Cities, like St. Paul, Minneapolis, even around here, I'll see somebody holding one of these signs that says, We'll work for food. Do you know why they hold these signs? Because they don't have very much money. Maybe they don't have a job, and, and they're willing to do some work if someone will give them some food. And sometimes I'm able to stop and give them some money and say, here, why don't you go buy yourself some food? Or, or maybe I have a, some food in the car with me. I'd share some food with them. 
But I have to admit, sometimes in my mind, I, I, I sinfully wonder. I'm like, well, I wonder if they really they could work, but they just don't want to. Or, or maybe uh, um, they're going to take the money I give them and go buy something that they shouldn't. And I have to confess those sins because I'm assuming and I'm thinking things that I just don't know the truth about. So I confess those sins. But the reason we want to look at this, this sign today is because in God's word, um, we want to see how Jesus would handle this. Now imagine that Jesus was driving in, in a car with you and he drove by somebody who was holding this sign and said, we'll work for food. What do you think Jesus would do? Just your, your best guess. What do you think he would do? Yeah, he'd probably stop and give them food. Very good. Yeah, he'd probably, because he loves and cares for them, he'd probably stop and give them some food. Or maybe, maybe he'd pick them up and drive them to McDonald's, and buy them a Happy Meal. That'd be delicious, right? Um, because, because Jesus cares for people. And we see that in the Bible, too. Back in Jesus' day, people were hungry and they needed food, and Jesus, very often, he provided food for them in a really miraculous way. He gave them what they needed because Jesus cares for our bodies, and he cares for our hearts and our souls, too. But here's the catch. Jesus cares not just about our bodies and our tummies, how much food is in there. He cares about that. But he cares about something even greater than that today. And you're going to hear that in God's word. See, Jesus cares about not just filling our tummies. He cares about filling our hearts. Because, you know, you can eat three times a day breakfast. Maybe you had something for breakfast before you came to church today. Maybe some cereal or a Pop-Tart. You're going to be hungry by the time you leave, right? You're going to want, want some of the donuts back there. Or you're going to be thinking, what are we having for lunch today? And then when you're done with lunch in the afternoon, you're going to be hungry again. You can eat three times a day, and yet you're still, you're still hungry, right? That's the way it is with our hearts, too. Our hearts don't eat food, but they need to be filled up with something. And sometimes we like to feed our hearts and fill up our hearts with maybe like a fun times, a fun day at the water park, or, or good times with our friends, things that make us smile and laugh and think, oh, my heart is just full, I'm satisfied. But then, you know, maybe it's the next day, we're already feeling down about something and our heart's empty again. We've got to keep filling up our hearts. Yeah, and, and, and we can never find enough heart food to make our hearts completely happy and full. But that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to fill up our hearts. Do you know how Jesus did that? Jesus filled up our hearts by dying on the cross to take away all of our sins. He filled up our hearts with the good news that God is your friend now and your sins are gone now and we have eternal life in heaven, the happiest place on earth waiting for us now. And every time you hear that message, like you're hearing it right now in church, or maybe you have a devotion with mom and dad at home. Or, or, or maybe uh, it's during Sunday school in the year. Jesus is feeding your heart. And he's filling you up. And the cool thing about that is, every time you feed on God's word, you are full. You're satisfied. And, and guess what? You don't have to work for that kind of food. Jesus did all the work. He died on the cross. He paid for our sins. He opened up heaven. So Jesus said, I'll do the work, you get the food. And that's the way it is with all of our lives too. So as you listen to God's word today, just keep that in mind that Jesus provides everything we need, especially for our hearts. Would you join me in just a, a closing prayer? Thank you. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving us so deeply that you gave us everything our hearts truly need. You came and, and did all of the hard work by dying on the cross and, and, and you fed us with that wonderful feast of good news that we are always loved, always forgiven, and always have a home in heaven waiting for us because you're such a, such a good God to us, dear Jesus. Thank you for that good news that filled up our hearts again today. Amen. Thank you so much. Picking up on that theme a little bit today, as we turn our hearts to God's word, we see in all three of our readings that 
God provides for us, not always in the way that we want, not always in the way that we pray, but always in the way that we need. And that, that's, that's our surest comfort and hope that God gives us and provides for us what we truly need in this life. And we'll see that in our first reading today from 1 Kings chapter 19. This will serve as our sermon text today as well. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up, eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. This is God's word. In response to that beautiful word of God, let's uh, speak Psalm 34 together this morning. Uh, we'll, we'll sing the refrain at the beginning and the end, and we'll, we'll speak those words responsively together this morning. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. The Lord redeems his servants. The writer to the Hebrews takes the first lesson showing that God provides for our physical needs and he applies it to our spiritual needs. And this is the challenge for us, I think, as Christians to recognize that God wants us to continually feed on his word, like we said in the children's message, but to keep growing in our knowledge of it. That confirmation class was not the end of our instruction, but just the foundation on which to keep growing every day, every year, growing in God's grace and knowledge. We see that in our second reading from Hebrews 5. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature by who, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so, grow in our faith. This is God's word. Alleluia. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Alleluia. Out of respect for the words that Jesus spoke, the acts that he did here on earth, we stand for the reading of the gospel. <laughs> 
Once again, Jesus drives home the point of the day, the theme of the day, that uh, he is the bread of life that satisfies our soul. He's the water of life that is a spring or a fountain in our hearts, always providing that which our heart truly craves, that connection, that relationship, that reconciliation with God. Jesus provides that fully and always. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him, Jesus, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated as we do just that, as we praise our Savior Jesus with the words of our next hymn. Grace and mercy and peace are all yours, brothers and sisters, and they're yours in abundance because, like we just said, they come to you as a free gift from God the Father through our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Amen. The Word of God we're going to focus and set our hearts upon this morning is our first reading from 1 Kings chapter 19, that Old Testament reading that's on page 5 of your service folder if you want to follow along. Elijah was afraid 
and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up, eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. This is the word of God. For, I'm sorry, I just apologize uh, for all of the, me walking up and down the aisles. Uh, my TV is dead back there, so I'm kind of blind. So I'm going to be kind of doing a little head dance here with you and looking at the screens. Try not to let that be a distraction, more of a distraction than it already has been. Let's just take a moment and set our hearts back on God's word uh, and pretend that pastor's not being silly this morning, okay? In Jesus' name. Um, things are a lot different today than they were at the time of the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. It's maybe hard for us to understand what life was like back then because it was so different. In fact, you think about back in the time before Jesus, the time leading up to Jesus being born here on earth, people didn't have a Bible. Like you and I have the, the entire Word of God written right in front of us on our bookshelf, on our coffee table. And so God sent prophets. Not fortune tellers, but word proclaimers. That's how people heard the Word of God, through the prophets. And Elijah was one of the best one of the strongest, one of the boldest, one of the most memorable prophets in the, in the entire Bible is Elijah. And I tell you, there's more than just one sermon's worth of wisdom that we can glean from the prophet Elijah's life today. But one thing we want to focus on from Elijah's life is this. That man was a powerful man of prayer, and God is a wonderful God of answers. Bold prayers and powerful answers. That's when we learn about Elijah. Bold prayers and powerful answers from God. Let me give you two examples. First example, um, Elijah the prophet was trying to discipline and instruct God's people not to rely on yourselves for life and think that your hard work and your hands and your labor brought you your daily bread and the wealth of your life. And so he actually prayed a prayer, a bold prayer to God that it would not rain and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Not a drop of dew on the grass for 42 months straight. It's a bold prayer. It's a powerful answer. But then on the day that Elijah prayed that it would rain again on Israel, even before he said amen, the thunder crowd, the clouds were rolling in and the rain came. It's a bold prayer to God, and God answered in a powerful way. Another example, which maybe we're more familiar with, happened actually on the same day that the rain came. You remember the, the, the showdown on Mount Carmel that Elijah had? So the Lord's people had pretty much, to a person, turned their back on the one true God, and they were worshiping a false god named Baal. And so Elijah, he, on top of Mount Carmel, he gathers everyone up there and says, kind of a my God versus your God kind of contest. And he says, we're both going to make an altar and we're going to have a sacrifice on that altar and we're going to pray to our, you pray to your God, I'll pray to the God and whoever's God sends fire down from heaven. That's the God who heard the prayer. That's the true God. And so he let the prophets of Baal go first and uh, prophets, plural, by the way, there's 450 prophets and they were yelling, and they were shouting, and they were screaming to their god Baal to wake up and send the fire. And for a half of a day, they even began to cut themselves and slash themselves and hurt themselves. Not so much as a spark. 
And it was Elijah the prophet's turn, and he didn't have to yell and scream and dance and cut himself. He, he did pray out loud so everyone could hear to whom he was really praying, to the true God. And down from heaven came fire. And that fire from God consumed the sacrifice on the altar. It consumed the altar itself, the stones, even the dirt around the altar. Bold prayer. Awesome answer from God. The reason I mention those two stories of Elijah's life is because we have a third prayer here today in the text before us. It's a bold prayer. This time God doesn't answer it. It kind of ties in the account before us this morning. It ties in with the last event I just talked about on top of Mount Carmel. Right after the, 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 the Lord sent fire down from heaven, Queen Jezebel, who was the queen at that time, she was humiliated because Baal was her God and those prophets were her prophets and, 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 the, and it was shameful to her and those prophets were put to death. So she signs a death warrant on that day to execute Elijah by the end of the day. And that's where we pick up right here. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And he keeps on running. In fact, he runs four days straight. Four hours south of Mount Carmel, he runs all the way down to Beersheba. And there he actually ditches his servant and he keeps on running by himself one more day into the desert, all alone. And he finds a little shrub and he kind of crawls underneath the shrub and he says, Oh, there's Mount Carmel. Um, Elijah says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Please, Lord, just let me die. Let me die. That was another bold and heartfelt prayer from the bottom of his heart. And God could have easily answered it, right? He sent the rain. He sent the fire. He could have just sent a lightning bolt. Boom. Elijah could have been done. But God chooses not to answer this prayer, this bold and heartfelt prayer from his prophet. I wonder what changed, I really do, in Elijah's heart and his mind to turn him from that really bold prophet making those bold prayers to to that guy. That happened in just less than a week. Less than a week before that he was standing on top of Mount Carmel boldly praying and and, and trusting that God had all power to help him and deliver him from his enemies. And then a few days later, there he was underneath a tree, frustrated, exhausted, tired, and just asking God to kill him, asking to die. I I wonder what, what changed in Elijah. I mean, he was a prophet. He was supposed to know better. He at least should have remembered from past experiences, right? That God was way more powerful than all of the enemies and all of the difficulties that he could face in this life. And that God was on his side. What? He was tired. He was exhausted. And just like the prophet Jonah, Elijah ran away from his problems and he hid And by the way, I wonder what he meant when he said, I'm no better than my ancestors. What do you think he meant by that? I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you. Was was that him saying, like my ancestors are dead, I want to be dead? Or maybe like my ancestors, they didn't believe in God and I believe in God, but there's no really difference because God didn't do anything for either of us? Or was he saying, my ancestors, the prophets, I'm like them, they preached and no one listened, I preach and no one listens? I don't know. But either way, I think it's hard for us to understand what happened to Elijah. To turn him from a bold, strong, trusting prophet to a man who was just frustrated, afraid, and in despair and running out into the desert and he just kind of plops down underneath this tree and and he wants to die. I I really don't know what was going on inside his head and mind, but I I guess I really can't understand because I didn't walk in his shoes, right? I don't know what it's like to be an Old Testament prophet and to feel that kind of weight on my life. 
But I really don't think personally that he understood what he was feeling and thinking either. I imagine his inner dialogue as he's running away from Mount Carmel for those four days, something like this. I just want to die. But I don't want Queen Jezebel to kill me. I should be trusting in God more, I know this, but, but God should be doing more for me. Why can't he? And does anyone else believe in God and try as hard as me? Because it feels like everything I'm doing is just a waste and God's not really doing anything for me. It's not really worth it. I know I can't understand what's going on in Elijah's heart and his mind, but I don't even think Elijah understood those feelings and those thoughts that on one hand he's bold and confident, on the other hand he's frustrated and afraid. And, and he wants to go and just fall underneath a tree, run away from it all, and just fall asleep. He says, he says, I've had enough. I've had enough. You ever been there? Maybe talking to a friend or you're trying to comfort and console a friend who's just had so much going on in their life and yet you just really can't truly understand what they're going through. You have a hard time helping them because you just don't know what to say. Or, or maybe you're the one who's feeling like you're drowning and just underneath the weight of struggle after struggle and trial after trial in your life where there's something challenging going on that you can't get out from underneath and, and you can't say it and explain it to anyone and yet you can't get out underneath from it either and you just feel like you're drowning. Well, maybe if you've been there, you never really got to the point that Elijah did and said, God, I just want to die. Maybe you did. Maybe you have. But maybe you, all, you prayed a prayer that was somewhat like that. Not, not God, take my life, but God, take this thing. Take this challenge off of me. It, it's too hard. You just wanted to run away from the challenge and be done with it and just curl up and fall asleep. Or maybe the problem is you just can't sleep because that thing is on your mind. But either way, God just chooses not to answer that prayer. And it's hard. Or does he? Elijah went to sleep thinking that he was all alone. And he woke up realizing that he was not all alone. There's that angel there who's there with him underneath that broom tree. And the angel says... Get up, Elijah. Get up and eat. And Elijah wakes up and there's on the ground some bread and a pitcher of water and he eats the bread and he drinks the water and it gives him just enough strength to fall back asleep. But once again, suddenly the, the angel is there again and waking up Elijah. Get up, eat. The journey is, is too much for you. And, and then he sees more bread more water because God knew just what Elijah needed and that without that the journey would have been too much for him. Did you notice there that there was no swift kick into the ribs of Elijah as he was sleeping underneath the broom tree? The angel didn't yell at him and say, get up Elijah, you'll be done when God says you're going to be done. No, it's a gentle touch. It's God answering Elijah's prayer. Not in the way that Elijah had wanted. Elijah didn't wake up in heaven. Elijah didn't wake up to find out that Jezebel had died. No, God answered it in a way far greater than Elijah even dared to ask. God provided everything that Elijah needed. God answered that prayer, didn't he? Elijah prayed, I've had enough. And God said through the angel, you're right. I know. Elijah, this is too much for you. But it's not too much for me. I've heard your every prayer, Elijah. I was right there with you. My angel was with you. I know your needs. I know exactly what you need. And in fact, I know what you need even when you ask for the wrong thing. And I know what you need even before you ask it. So here's some bread, here's some water. It's time to get up and, and head out on your journey. This, this journey is too much just for you. So here, take what you need. 
to keep on going. One of the questions that is really helpful for you to ask and me to ask as you're reading your Bible every day at home by yourself, when you're reading a passage or a section of Scripture, ask yourself this question. What is the most surprising thing to me in this passage? Can I share with you some of the the answers that I personally gleaned from this section this week as I was reading it? Some of the most surprising things to me from this section was, number one, how, again, we mentioned how Elijah fell so quickly from being so bold in one hand and a couple days later, despair, wanting to die. And yet when I think about it, that's not what, that one's not super surprising when I look at my own faith and the swinging that it goes back and forth sometimes because of the circumstances in my life. I can be strong one day and doubting so quickly the next. Next one, what's so surprise, surprising about this section or this passage? I wondered... How could a little bread and water last 40 days and 40 nights for this old man to travel? And I remember, well, there's a lot of other miracles recorded in the Bible, right? Even more miraculous than this. With God, all things are possible. Next surprising thing that occurred to me was, how could Elijah not have noticed what God was doing there? Right? The angel the miraculous bread and water twice, the 40-day journey without having to eat or drink or stop or sleep? How could he not have noticed God answering his prayer? Well, the answer to that question is only found by reading the rest of chapter 19. I encourage you to do it at home on your own. After that 40-day and 40-night journey, Elijah gets to the end of that journey and guess what what he says? Same thing. My life is too hard. I want to be done. I want to quit. I want to die. But I think the thing that takes the cake, the question that's most surprising to me from this section is, why did God give Elijah exactly what he needed? Even though Elijah asked for something different and even though Elijah didn't even notice it when God gave it. I think the answer is surprising and yet it's very clear to us, right? We know the answer to that question. And every time we hear the answer to that question, it's still a surprise to us. Why did God give Elijah what he needed even though Elijah asked for something different, even though Elijah didn't even recognize it when God answered it? The answer to that question is found in the answer to Elijah's prayer. Did you catch it? It was very subtle. It was in that angel. God sent that angel. That was no ordinary angel, by the way. It was not one of the the angels from God's vast army of angels. It was a very special, special angel God sent to Elijah. Do you know who it was? It was actually Jesus. Yeah, the angel of the Lord. Very often in the Old Testament is a term God applies to himself when it's talking about Jesus before he was born here on earth, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, the eternal Son of God, Elijah was exhausted, tired, afraid, wanted to die. And what was God's answer? To send him Jesus. Just what he needed. He sent Jesus the bread of life to come to Elijah when he was alone and afraid, when it was too much for Elijah, it wasn't too much for God. God gave him exactly what he needed. He always gives his best. He sent Jesus. Brothers and sisters, that's exactly the same for you and for me too. We have challenges in our life that I have no idea what you're going through. And even if I sat down and talked with you, I would love to hear and listen and and, and shed a tear with you and, and pray with you. But the reality is I probably can't completely understand your life. Nor can you mine. But God does. Completely. And his answer, his very best answer to your heartfelt and bold prayers about your trials and struggles in this life, the very best answer he always sends is Jesus. And just like Elijah, he didn't wait for us to ask for that, 
He didn't wait for enough people to ask to send Jesus down from heaven before God the Father sent his son Jesus to come and take away the sins of the world. And when Jesus was up on that cross and the people around him didn't even know that it was their sins punishing and causing suffering and death for Jesus, Jesus didn't come down from the cross just because they didn't know what was going on. Jesus stayed until it was finished. God gave us his best when he gave us Jesus. He's the bread of life that fills up our hearts and fills up our souls perfectly. And dear friends, he doesn't stop forgiving you even when you don't appreciate it. He doesn't stop forgiving you. And he doesn't stop caring for you even when you think he's doing a lousy job at it and you feel like you should give him some advice about it. He doesn't stop caring for you. And he doesn't stop hearing and answering every prayer pouring out of your heart and your mouth, even when we ask for the wrong things, even when we think prayer is kind of a, a useless tool that doesn't work, that doesn't stop God from hearing and answering every groan, every sigh, every cry. Because he always gives us the best when he gives us Jesus. In fact, the Bible says every promise is a yes in God's book because of Jesus Christ. Because he died, because he rose, you can see how much God loves you, cares for you, provides for you, and answers you through Jesus. There's a beautiful way that this entire story ends. And I know it's not written down in our, our service folder today, but I encourage you on your own, if you go back home together as a couple or as a family or as an individual, read just the rest of chapter 19 of 1 Kings. It'll take you two minutes. But it's a remarkable ending to the story. I'll give you the highlights. After that 40-day journey that Elijah took that 40 days and 40 nights he comes to the end uh, to Mount Horeb and a cave is there and he wants to see God's glory he wants to see the answer to his prayer in the way that he prayed it I want to see your glory Lord and God graciously and patiently says okay I'll show you my glory get in that cave over there and get ready you don't miss it Elijah gets in the cave and he stands there and I'm coming through that mountain pass is an F5 tornado just tearing the mountain apart. But God wasn't in that tornado. Then an earthquake shakes the mountain. God wasn't in that earthquake. Then a firestorm comes raging through the mountain valley and God wasn't in the firestorm. And then a quiet and gentle whisper comes through that mountain. There was God. God came to meet Elijah in words. And God promises the same for you too. When you pray to God, know that he hears your prayers and, and he wants to act to deliver you in the very best possible way. But know this, God comes to you most closely, most dearly, most truly and most intimately when he comes to you through the gentle and the quiet whisper of his word. When you have a devotion, when you hear a sermon, when you hear the words of absolution in church, you might blink and miss it, but there, there is God himself coming to you, giving you his very best, giving you Jesus, giving you salvation. And when you have Jesus, when you have God's word, you have enough. It's all that you need. And God promises to provide that. Amen. May the peace of God, which transcends human hearts and minds, cause you to stay strong in your faith through Jesus Christ, whom God sends through his word and sacraments. Amen. I invite you to stand with me now as we join in give glory to God by confessing all of the wonderful things God is and does through the words of the Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. With hearts of thanks and love, we offer our gifts to Jesus at this time. During the offering, I invite you to fill out the pew registers as a way we can show love to one another here at St. John's. Thank you. And now, just like Elijah, let's stand and bring God our bold and confident prayers. This morning we include prayers on behalf of those who are still suffering or, or recovering or struggling with illnesses or from surgeries or otherwise. Um, Wally Growth is still recovering from his surgery. Uh, Marilyn Lee is still at home recovering from hers. Uh, and all those uh, brothers and sisters who continue to struggle with their recoveries and illnesses. We pray to God for them. Dearest Lord Jesus, do not give up on us. Save us from giving up on you and ourselves when at times we just feel like we've had too much, we've had enough. The devil laughs out loud at our repeated failures and our sins and we cry in shame over them. But still, Lord, let us keep clinging to your cross and its powerful promise of pardon and grace for the world, for us, for me. And when we hear your promise, then all the accusations of the devil and the struggles of this life and the consciences even in our hearts cannot take away the victory that you have won and delivered to, to us by your suffering, death, and resurrection. When we have you, dear Jesus, we always have everything we truly need and more. And Lord, please provide for the needs and hear the prayers of our suffering brothers and sisters. We ask rest, rest and recovery for Wally Growth, recovering from surgery, and Marilyn Lee, recovering at home. Make your home in their hearts through the word, and then give them healing in their bodies and minds and souls as well. We pray all these things with boldness and confidence through Jesus our Savior, in whose name we continue to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things that you want us to believe and do. Help us now by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, both now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Please remain standing as we sing our closing hymn.